This is Billy Kay with the story of the Scots in Hawaii. Programme 2, The Scotch Coast. I'm on the big island of Hawaii, standing on the beautiful coastline north of the port of Hilo, which on the maps is called the Hamakua Coast. Locally though, the area is still called the Scotch Coast because the sugar plantations here were dominated by Scots managers, engineers and overseers. In the 1920s, Hawaii was producing some 900,000 tonnes of sugar, with around 30 plantations run by Scots. Here on the Scots coast, a fellow airsman from Darville, John Dykes, looking back, said, at that time, I think there were 16 plantations, and 13 of them were managed by Scotsmen. As long as I can remember, it was called the Scotch Coast. And that was because of the great number of Scots people that were there. Yeah. There were just so many that came through. And I know there's a town in Scotland that the whole town, at some point, every able bodied man came to Hawaii in turns. Welcome, Billy, to this house in Kirimuir, which is called Manoa. My husband's aunts went to visit Hawaii in the 1930s. They visited their brothers who lived in Manoa Valley in Honolulu, and when they came back, they changed the name of the house to Manoa. When I came to Oahu in 1975, I met an old man called Duncan Campbell, who remembered leaving Cooper Angus on a horse and trap bound for a job in the sugar industry of Hawaii. Like me, he could recite Tamashanter by heart, so we did a shared performance of it, which pleased both of us more than you can imagine. Duncan Campbell always sang the star of Rabbi Burns at Bernstein. <laughs> Duncan had an uncle that was the plantation manager at Waimanalo. He got there in 1898, but Duncan came out in 1927. In the case of our grandfather, he came here looking for work as a blacksmith. But he ended up at Hilo Sugar here. He was in Hilo, Hawaii, and was a Luna with a sugar company there. He left in 1895 when there was the revolt on behalf of the queen to reinstall her to the throne, and he was part of that. That was squashed rather quickly, and he had to flee Hawaii because of fear of being arrested. My father had a cousin, he was a stone grinder, and coming from the granite city of Aberdeen, he came here to grind stones for one of the sugar plantations. They mashed the cane stalks with heavy stones. Most of the sugar machinery, the boilers and mill rollers, came from Glasgow. Because the Scots were such good machinists, they had made probably sugar cane machinery for almost everywhere in the world. Merlis, Watson, were represented here in Hawaii. That's one reason why almost every sugar grower knew the Scottish connection. These people were creating the means by which they were refining sugar. Henry Dwight Damon, Donald Crabe, Fred Kernan, Ian Birney and Lillian Cunningham in Hawaii and Mamie Jemison in Manoa, Kirim Ewer. Another major strand of Scottish interest in Hawaii arose out of the excess wealth generated by the Dundee textile industry and the creation of trusts like the Western and Hawaiian Investment Company in 1880. Charles Munn, who wrote A History of the Alliance Trust, and Grant Lindsay on the Dundonian pioneer Alexander Gourley. On arrival at Honolulu, Gourley noticed there were some Glaswegian sugar merchants there who were dealing with local plantation owners, advancing them loans to expand their business. And he thought, I could do that. Scots being Scots, you know, simply looked for opportunities wherever they could find them. And of course, there were connections. Both Dundee and Hawaii were major centres of the whaling business, for example. The very first loan that was advanced was to the Moani Sugar Refinery, which operated on the island of Molokai. The Honoka sugar plantation and then there was the Honomu. These are the three we know for sure that were getting money from Dundee for investment in their activities. It's fairly certain too that these would be companies that were using equipment from Middle East Watson. My father actually served his blacksmithing apprenticeship there in the 1920s. 
The local board was very interesting. There was a former prime minister on it, a minister of finance, a minister of the interior. So if you're going to go in there, why not go in at the top and it with huge influence? The King, David, he became a shareholder. It's hard to know just the extent to which he became involved, but he certainly bought shares. There was one reference in your chapter there about a lawyer, McCrindle, being summoned back to Dundee. I don't know if he ever came. He did come. There was even a consul, a Hawaiian consul in Dundee at one stage. Soller, his name, a German yeah. name. It takes 24 hours today to get to Hawaii. Then mm. it must have been... A month's a month, journey. A month's journey, that's right, yeah. Just to have a meeting. Just to have a meeting. These sugar plantations were making, like, uh, if they were capitalised for, like, $800,000, they were making $800,000 a year. They were doubling their capital every year. So it was really a profitable enterprise in those days. The industry also relied on fast ships, and one of them, built in the Clyde, still sits in Honolulu Harbour, Bruce McEwen. She carried oil to the uh, plantations on the Big Island. And we're standing beside you here in the beautiful aquamarine water of the bay. Falls of Clyde, Honolulu, it says, and it's adorned and garnished by a beautiful garland of thistles all around it. Absolutely beautiful. The shipping, it was just incredible back then. The first ship that went through the Panama Canal was a sugar barge from Hawaii going to a refinery, so, you know, it's, it was just important traffic. Chris Fye. Richard, or Scotchy Henderson, as he's better known, became a prominent politician in Hawaii. Here he is on another Henderson who achieved substantial wealth on the Big Island. Jim Henderson, he was apprenticing as a blacksmith in Scotland, and there was an ad for a blacksmith for Hilo Sugar, I think it was. So he told his employer that he was leaving to go to Hawaii because they pay blacksmiths 10 pounds a month. And his employer told him that he was a very foolish young man because anybody who paid you 10 pounds a month wouldn't be in business very long. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he came out as a blacksmith. He ended up going to Hakalau Sugar Company and worked his way up and became a field superintendent. Well, at Hakalau, he married one of the Macy girls, the Macy's. They were a big family there. When my mother and father came here in 1923, Leigh Henderson used to ride down on her horse to have tea with my mother. Did they have scones? Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. So he was a blacksmith from Scotland who came to Hawaii, and he did very well. The Caledonian Society's book of the Scots in Hawaii tells the story of Willie Robertson, who was thinking of emigrating to Singapore at the end of World War I. But then James Johnson, the manager of Oakala Plantation, came to his village of Fordun in the Mairns, recruiting men for Hawaii. Johnson was immaculately turned out with diamond studs, gold cufflinks and a diamond ring. That's for me, <laughs> said Willie. I'm heading for Hawaii. So I think he actually yes. thought if he went to Hawaii, he'd end up with gold cufflinks and diamond rings Right, right, right. You can see it actually in the layout of the plantation towns. The plantation manager's house was always way up sort of on the hill. The manager was king. Manager was king. king. Uh, police reported to him. Yeah, it was a feudal society yeah, in yes. a way, but a very paternalistic society. Every plantation had its own hospital, had yeah. its own medical care, had its own doctor. And then you'd have what are known as the Lunas, and many of the Scots ended up being Lunas, and Luna is sort of a middle management type of person that would ride around on horseback and make sure everybody was doing their work. And then below that, you would have you know the new groups that were coming in. There were two camps, basically, that I can recall. They were the Filipinos, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Portuguese, congregating in the camps. Bob Osborne and Momi Norton on the way of life on the plantations of the Scotch coast, experienced by Bill Kushney, Gene Sikovic and Ken Forbes. You had to be there at five in the morning, and he didn't come home until five at night. I think that's what all them Scots did back then. They worked their butts off. I got up at 4.15 every day for 13 years at Mauna Kea Sugar. I'd get home 4 o'clock, 4.30, unless I had a long grievance meeting, because the union always wanted to file a grievance. I said, fine, I'll meet you at 4.30 in the morning, 
<laughs> Gila Coast. I'll meet you at 4.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that cut half the grievances. <laughs> well, I would like to think that they were strict but fair, yeah. but I've also heard that the ones who were lunas, that they were very strict. They were the ones who rode on horseback and cracked the whip. The saying is, you know, that the uh, higher-ups should get off their white horse. And there was a lot of resentment. I mean, even as field superintendent at Mauna Kea Sugar, I would get nailed by the business agents from the union to get off my white horse. And I would go right back at them, and I said, look, I grew up with these guys in their house. I ate their food. They came to my house. So we got that settled. But generally, in the old days, the Scotsmen were held up to a higher level. They were yeah. considered the Lunas. Their kuleana was to make sure that the plantation ran. Generally, they were well-respected and got along, but there was always a few individuals <coughs> that got in trouble. Well, they just looked down at the labor and talked to them in a very negative way. That offended them. Yeah. But growing up in Pahala, my brother and I, two sisters, and maybe three or four others were the only white people. The Howleys. The only Howleys. We lived with the kids. I went to their house. My mother would have them come to our house, and we thought nothing of discrimination. We just loved it. My brother and I loved to go to lunch at school every day and take our sandwich and have their rice ball and, and cut up uh, tube steak, which yeah. is a hot dog. What kinds of food did you get then? Japanese, Filipino, Portuguese, the whole works. Growing up on the plantations, those were the days that were so much fun. I know I'd spend days with two Japanese boys and we'd start at Pipikil and fish all the way along the coast to Kole Kole. And we'd come back with all our fish, sell it to the Filipinos in the plantation camps. So did you have a, quite a business going? No, no business. <laughs> it was just summer days, climbing up and down the cliffs. You'd get bust up all the time. Rocks will come loose, and we'd have to climb down cliffs to get to a landing area to where we could fish. A hole hole, gizami, gode, opihis, shellfish that we would take and keep ourselves because we loved them. Put them in a pot of shoyu and boil them and then just sit there with pins pulling out the meat and eating wow. them. The children of the different groups then got on very well in this childhood paradise, but there were occasional culture clashes among the older folk. Bond dances, Japanese, where they have plenty of music, plenty of dancing, plenty of lights, and for a college <laughs> kid it was like a carnival. Anyway, what happened was Robert Ford got fed up with the Japanese music. And he hauls out his bagpipes and he starts walking up and down the veranda playing bagpipes. And you know how loud bagpipes are. When I first heard that, I cracked up. But you know, the second thought was, oh my God, Bob, I'm sure that you are not appreciated by the Japanese folks. Working in the fields in those days was ho-hana. You were given a hoe and you were told to weed 1,700 vine of cane. And believe me, that was not pleasant work. It was okay in the morning when it was cool, but when the sun came up, it was terrible. So most of us went on contract, which meant that if you hold your 1,700 feet, we say pow, finished for the day, and you'd go home. And so in order to get home, we'd jump in the flume and ride the flume down to the main road. We jumped in and we'd slide down the flume a lot. You know, you'd get splinters up your butt, <laughs> but we'd always bail out before you got to the uh, cleaning plant. Even at a very young age, I know I was up climbing the flume and trying to ride, ride the water ride down the flume. the flume. They would cut the cane by hand and then they would put it in the flume and they would flume it down to the uh, cleaning plant. What distance? Miles. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then we would uh, get on the high flumes right next to the forest and they had this giant ivy that grew on the trees and we'd play Tarzan. We'd jump off the top of the flume, swing through the forest back and forth. <laughs> Jumping in is easy. But getting out is the hard part. They, they had a lot of California grass, which was a very, very, it'd grow six feet high. And it would cover the flume, and so we'd grab the California grass. But you got to stop the water. So, you know, we're all grabbing 
grass and sides of flumes in the water is backing up, right. and then you're able to get out. And the water flumes come in handy for another purpose during Prohibition, when Scotch whisky was hard to come by. Dwight Damon and Alan Buchanan. They were distilling some alcohol. When they got the tip off of the customs coming, they would open up the sluice gates and send the stuff down to different parts of the island in barrels and stuff. <laughs> Written in 1875 in a Scottish-American journal, the article describes the Scots in Hawaii. And it says, all seem to have more or less the mither wit of old Scotia, and many of them have succeeded well in these islands. Some are influential merchants, while others have attained to respectable and lucrative positions. A few, however, are too fond of the dram, and in consequence, make little headway. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that continued to be true. I think so. I'm a moderate drinker, I must tell you, but uh, some of us have been uh, a little overboard. Uh, tell me the story of this liquor here that you brought, which yeah. smells like brandy. Well, it is called Okoli Hau. Okoli Hau breaks down in the Hawaiian language into Okoli, which means butt, or derriere, or ass, if you wish, <laughs> and Hau, which is steel. And I think it comes from the tripods from the whale ships, and they would utilize these to make stills to extract liquor from the tea root, a kind of sacred Hawaiian plant. Now it's got a, a root that really makes a fine liquor and the Damon's requisition during Prohibition, 1,000 gallons of this stuff. <laughs> and is this still made commercially? Oh no, you can't make it commercially what? because they don't know how it was made. This was made in 1928 when Samuel Rennie commissioned 1,000 gallons of it. I'm going to taste this. It's Langeva. Oh, it's Maybe. Langeva. Powerful aguardent. Quite fiery, but because it's been matured so long, it's got quite a mellow taste as well, and quite a long finish to it. You're rich, an expert, sir. Rich in cognac -y in flavour, but I think with a touch of coffee and maybe some spice in it as well. Lovely stuff. A I, historic I, drum. I, I, you are one of the lucky fellows because, you know, there's a lot of talk about Okoli Hau, but hardly anybody has this stuff anymore, you know. They used to arrest people left and right for their stills during Prohibition. I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow town. I belong to Glasgow. My father used to sing, I belong to Hilo, good old Hilo town. But there's something the wrong with Hilo. We're just going round and round. I'm only a common old I'm only a no. common working chap, as, as any man can see. But when after I get a couple, couple of drinks on a Saturday, Saturday Hilo belongs to me. me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Glasgow. <laughs> Barbara Moyer of the Lyman Museum there in fine voice. Another Scots social import to Hawaii was Freemasonry. My father was a 32nd degree Mason, and a lot of the Scots belonged to the Scottish Rite Temple. And our last king, Kalaakaua, was a prominent Mason. That probably served as a meeting place for many of the Scots. And then the Burns Building was right down here on the corner of Keavi and Wainuinui. And across the street was the Bank of Hawaii, and above that was the Masonic Hall. So that's where a lot of the Scots were involved with the Masons. They would get together up the volcano quite frequently in one or the other's uh, clubhouses. You know, I couldn't understand a lot of the Scotsmen. And you know how they liked their drink. It made it even worse. You couldn't understand anything. <laughs> They all had their fun. They loved their dances, they and they loved their tennis on Sundays and the golf. We played cricket out at Pepekeo. Oh, really? They had a Hilo team and a Pepekeo team. And afterwards, it was go up to the old boarding house and drink and party up. But within the Forbes family, Scottish culture was passed down in the grandparents' home. Danny played the piano, and Bapa played both the bagpipes and the violin. So they would play music, Scottish tunes. Well, well if you got little... them together and a little yeah. alcohol, they'd yeah. start singing oh. their old songs. My great-grandfather, Forbes, in Muffles, played with J. Scott Skinner. Wow, he was called the Strathspey King. He was the greatest fiddler of his era. He 
you better know to quiet down and listen. It wasn't a lighthearted thing for them, in a sense. They were trying to play well. And she took her Bobby Burns seriously, too. It would be their desire to pass on respect for yes, their culture. That's the other way to, to the look children. At it. As I think back on it now, what she was experiencing was a very abrupt change in terms of the, the cultural heritage. I learned the Highland Fling and I had a kilt when I was little and all of these heritage things that they wanted the children to learn. My mother said on more than one occasion that the Scots are the salt of the earth. Yeah, I mean, they are the tops. They believed it. Oh yeah. But the vast distance separating them from their homeland and their extended family left a poignant mark. In Honolulu, I spoke to Isabel Lam Ryan, Doug Philpotts and Elspeth Kerr. I never knew them until I was grown up, you know? That was tough. Was your mum homesick? Oh, yeah. I think she was. <sighs> Remember when we used to get telegrams? She would get these wirelesses about somebody dying, yeah. and that was really hard, and that was very sad, and it made her really well, long yeah. to be there, yeah. There were times when he would be homesick, I'm sure, and yeah. reminisce for the old country. And he taught me a few songs. He taught me the railroad stations. Do you remember Baba being stern and strict? I just remember going to the house and uh, eating shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> Scones and tarts. And I had a next door neighbor, Kay, who was terrific. She used to make fly cemeteries. That was the raisins in the middle. Right. My dad called them fleas grave years. Yeah. We had hot soup every night. Even in summertime, you know, you sat down and you had soup, roast beef, or you had potatoes. What they ate in Scotland, they ate in Hawaii. She made something called mince. Yeah. That yeah, was from Scotland. Mince. I forgot about mince. Yeah. It was just ground beef, but yeah. that was, I guess, Scottish, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. Mince and tatties. Did you have that as well? Oh, yes. We had Finn well, and Hattie all the time. We had Finn and Hattie, too. I wish I knew how to make it. Yes. Because I really liked it. You know, they had a big Scottish soccer team here because I have pictures of them there and I have the picture of the whole team with their striped tops and, mm -hmm. you know, their socks up to the knees. And my dad used to bounce the ball on his head and show us how they did it. It's called heading the ball, oh, not bouncing the ball well, on your head. <laughs> C.C. Kennedy, he's almost like Andrew Carnegie. He built the library for Hilo. He was a very generous guy. He ran YKM Mill. In 1909, the local newspaper in Kirimur in Angus covered a big dinner here in Hilo, celebrating the Hilo football team's lifting of the C.C. Kennedy Cup. Oh, and yeah. all but two of the guests were Scots at the dinner, and the team had no less than eight players from Kirimur. My father was a good soccer player, and they used to have a team in Hilo. All the Scots that were out the coast, and when a French ship would come in, they'd have their own soccer team, and they'd have their matches down in Moyal Park on Bayfront in Hilo. So that'd be an international game, Scotland versus France. France, yeah, yeah. They had the German boats had their soccer teams. The way of life on the sugar plantations regretfully came to an end on the Hamakua coast in the 1990s, but on Maui, it lasted till 2016. Ian Kinnear on the end of an era. We are probably right dead center of one of the villages on the plantation. This is the last sugar operation on Maui and in Hawaii. The mill itself, we're just passing it by, it looks like a relic from the Industrial Revolution, it, it, doesn't it? it, it? it is. Huge tubes and huge pipes and yeah. smoke billowing yeah. into the sky. The two buildings right in the center, that was the original mill there. And yes. then everything's just added. So that's how it kind of looks like a sprawling... Industrial complex. That's, that's right. And it's so incongruous. For us today, our image of Maui is of beaches and surfing and things That's like right, that, yeah. isn't it? So will this be the last manufacturing process on the island? Yeah. Did you ever chew the cane? As oh, a boy. Yeah. yeah, that's what we did. And it's very good, especially if it's just burnt, burnt cane. That was really sweet. That's the best sugar there is. <laughs> when, you're, when you're a little boy like me, I guess. 
month. We enjoyed that. But you became a dentist because of people eating too, too much, much sugar. Too much sugar. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I, I, I straddled the fence there, didn't I? <laughs> Is it sad to see the sugar industry oh, disappear? Definitely. Not only the loss of jobs, but the landscape and accessibility to the mountains and the ocean. Now people have bought up right. and they've fenced everything off. You can't trespass. And that's real difficult. And they're... Mainland Howleys, most of them that have come here. People with money that have bought land and put up these fabulous houses. And of course, they got to protect them, so they fence everything off. So you feel as if part of your heritage has gone? Oh, definitely. It was a great way of life for me. Where I live in Kekaha is a community created by the sugar industry. So, you know, you have all kinds of people, but our common connection is that past with the sugar industry and the tight community we grew up in. Chris Fai on the beautiful Isle of Kauai. The sugar industry has gone, but I'll leave you with the financial legacy back in Dundee and the cultural legacy on the Scotch coast of Hawaii. The Western Hawaiian Investment Trust continued quite successfully. It was profitable, it was well run, and it wasn't until the 1920s that the name was changed to the Second Alliance Trust. The two trusts, the Alliance Trust, got started in 1888 and it wasn't until a very few years ago that they merged. That created a very big organisation in Dundee which actually became one of the, the FTSE 100 companies for a time. From this relatively small sum of money that was put into Hawaii of £20,000, at the end of the year we're sitting with assets close to £3 billion. Pounds. An astonishing story. And some of that wealth is still coming back to Dundee and Angus. Of course it is, yeah, very much so. It's a large part of the economy of Dundee even yet. What about your identity? Did they pass on a sense of Scottish identity? Oh yeah, yeah, Scots were the salts of the earth. Absolutely. They're a proud race. When I think about wherever I got my Scotchness from, you know, and I did. We're Scots. I'm, I'm only half Scotch, okay? But I'm Scotch. It came from my yeah. grandmother. When people ask us what our ethnicity is, I'm proud to say that I'm Scottish. I think we all are. My two girls, Jennifer and Tanya, they got eight bloodlines. Yeah. Because my wife is Portuguese, Chinese, Hawaiian, English. And then my side is Scotch, Irish, English, Cherokee. So when you ask them what they are, it's a complicated first, answer. First one is <laughs> Scotch, though.